Good evening and welcome, special welcome to the folks who are watching at home. It's good for us to all be together for worship wherever we happen to be. A couple announcements before we begin. I want to remind our high school seniors and college students that scholarship application deadline is April 30th, so please see the church website for more information on that. I also have some uh, virtual lecture spots to fill in May. So if you haven't done a reading in a while or you'd like to do another one, please let me know and I'll get you on the schedule. Uh, this week we began our new faith practice reading through the book of Psalm. So Psalm 1 was our reading for this past week. And so the psalmist writes, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread. Instead, for the right to claim the candy bar off the speaker up front here, happy are those who delight in what? Anyone get that? Go ahead. The law of the Lord. Happy are those who delight in the law of the Lord. On God's instruction, they meditate day and night. Our readings each week are sequential, so this coming week will be in chapter 2. Let us now begin our time of worship with song. stand for the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. 
We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading comes from the third chapter of Acts. Emma Morgan is our virtual lector. Acts chapter 3, 12 through 17. Peter addressed the people, you Israelites, why did you wonder at this? Or why did you stare at us? As though by our own power of, or pity, we have made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, have glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate. Through, he had decided to release him, but you rejected the whole holy and right us, one and asked to have a murder given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnessed, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through, Jesus has given him this perfect health and presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted ignorant, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what we had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. We repent, therefore, and that in turn to God so that the, your sins may be wiped out. Our second reading comes from the third chapter of 1 John. Nancy Strosher is our virtual lector. The second reading is from the book of 1 John, chapter 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Here ends the second reading. Our gospel video clip comes from the 24th chapter of Luke. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. 
a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Easter evening in Jerusalem. So Jesus had already appeared to Mary and the other women that morning. Peter and the other disciple ran and saw the empty tomb. That afternoon, Jesus appeared to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. After they recognized him in the breaking of the bread, they immediately turned around and went back to Jerusalem to tell the others that they had seen the risen Lord. Then Luke says, while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. Luke tells us they were startled and terrified they thought they were seeing a ghost. I suppose peace be with you is a timely greeting. Those disciples were in desperate need of some peace. They were scared to death, and not just because they thought they were seeing a ghost. They had bet their lives on Jesus and lost big. They'd seen him arrested, some watched from afar as they crucified him, others fled for their lives. They had gathered together this night behind locked doors. They were afraid that the people who had killed Jesus would be coming for them next. Yes, these two from Emmaus were saying that Jesus was alive, but that was hardly believable. These disciples knew about death. Some of them had buried a father or a mother, perhaps a wife or a child. Death is final. Death is the end. Not in their wildest imagination could they believe that rising from the dead is even possible. Then all of a sudden, they find Jesus standing in their midst saying, Peace be with you. Of course they were terrified. I would be too. This kind of stuff just doesn't happen. But Jesus offers them peace, and he takes the time to show them that he's not a ghost. He shows them his hands and his feet, the wounds from the nails. Jesus asks for food, and he eats the fish they give him. He isn't a ghost, not at all. The same Jesus who died is now alive again with them. And then Jesus begins to teach them things that they could not have understood before the resurrection. He says, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And then he tells the disciples, You are witnesses of these things. Now, we might be inclined to doubt the possibility of the disciples, except for what happens next. These frightened, dispirited disciples suddenly become energized, 
afraid of nothing. In 40 days, we'll see them gather in Jerusalem, the place where Jesus was crucified, and they will preach in the streets and baptize people by the thousands. They will lay the foundation of the church, and their work will change the world. They will become the witnesses Jesus said they would be. Now, a witness, of course, is someone who has seen something, who knows what happened, someone who can tell others what they had experienced. So that's what Jesus expects of these first disciples, that they would tell people what happened, that they would proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sin that Jesus proclaimed. And the disciples did that. Beginning in Jerusalem at Pentecost, they were witnesses and they changed the world. That's what Jesus expected of them, and that's what Jesus expects of us as well. He expects us to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins. He expects us to tell people what happened at the cross and the empty tomb. Now, changing the world sounds pretty dramatic, so maybe we don't start with that. But Jesus does expect us to make a difference in people's lives. Of course, we weren't among that little band of disciples huddled in fear who saw Jesus in the flesh, risen from the grave, but we've seen people whose lives have been changed by Jesus. There are people in worship today with us whose lives have been changed by Jesus. Jesus has changed lives and is continuing to change them. We are not what we will be, but we are not what we were either. Jesus has changed our lives. And we've benefited by the witness of other Christians. I've known Christians over the years famous people who write books and speak publicly about, about living the Christian life, but also the ordinary people, people who sit in the pew each week, people who wouldn't say that they're an extraordinary witness, but they're ordinary people of extraordinary faith, extraordinary kindness, extraordinary generosity. These people make a powerful witness for Christ in what they say and do. They witness Christ by the quality of their lives. C.S. Lewis wrote a book about those ordinary saints. He was talking about his difficulty when he first became a Christian, getting up to go to church on Sunday morning. He said, if there's anything in the teaching of the New Testament which is in the nature of a command, it's that you're obligated to take the sacrament, and you can't do that without going to church. And then he went on to say, I disliked very much their hymns, which I considered to be fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music. But as I went on, I saw the great merit of it. I came up against all kinds of different people of quite different outlooks and different education, and gradually my conceit began peeling off. That's a nice line. My conceit just began peeling off. He went on to say, I realized that the hymns, which were fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music, were nevertheless being sung with devotion and benefit by an old saint in elastic side boots in the opposite pew. And then you realize you aren't fit to clean those boots. He concluded, it gets you out of your solitary conceit. Now, I don't know that we have any elastic side boots in the sanctuary today, but I do know that we have saints sitting in these pews and watching from home. Ordinary people by most measures, but people of faith. People whose lives are distinguished by kindness, by generosity and compassion and love. Their witness demonstrates the potential of the Christian life, 
of repentance, of forgiveness, of grace. Christ calls us to be people like that, people whose lives witness to his power to redeem and to save, people whose lives draw others to his love. In his book, Sources of Strength, Jimmy Carter tells the story of Eloy Cruz, a Cuban pastor. Carter noticed that Cruz had a wonderful wonderful rapport with Puerto Rican immigrants, very poor people. Cruz had a wonderful ability to connect with them and lovingly direct their lives. Carter asked Cruz for the secret of his success. Cruz was embarrassed to be singled out by the former president, but he finally said this, Senior Jimmy, we only need to have two loves in our lives, love for God and love for the person who happens to be in front of us at the time. There are many great stories that I can share about people whose witness for Christ took some dramatic form people who risked their lives for someone else, people who were persecuted for their faith, people who forgave the person that killed their spouse or their child. There are volumes of those kind of stories. But I didn't want to share any of those dramatic stories today because we might be tempted to say, well, I could never do that. Maybe. But I believe we can all do what Pastor Cruz called us to do. Two things, we can love God and we can love the person who happens to be standing in front of us. And really, that's all it takes to proclaim the gospel. That's all it takes to witness our faith. That's all it takes to show people Christ. We just need to love God and love the person who happens to be standing in front of us. Dramatic stories are wonderful and faith-inspiring, but what Jesus needs from us is not necessarily dramatic stories, but for each of us, ordinary people, to become one of those humble witnesses, loving God and loving the person standing in front of us. Amen. stand as we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Living God, in the midst of Easter joy, we are still filled with questions and wondering. Open our hearts and minds as we encounter the scriptures, so that the church embodies repentance and forgiveness in the name of Jesus to all nations. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creating God like a master artist, you have fashioned the universe out of your love and delight. Heal your creation where it is in need of restoration. Provide all the inhabitants of earth a peaceful and sustainable home. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all the nations, hunger and thirst for your righteousness. Many call on you for guidance and strength. Answer their hopes with the peace of Christ and give your loving kindness to national, state, and local leaders of people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Healing God, you hear the cries of those in need and answer them in their distress. Grant to those who are sick and suffering your compassion and nurse them back to health and wholeness. Today we pray especially for Audrey, Phyllis, and Jeff, for Becky, Carol, Dave, and all of those we name before you now. Be close to the hearts of the lonely. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Loving parent, you have given us such love that we should be called the children of God. Reveal yourself to us so that we in this community of faith will become more and more like you in our mutual love and bold witness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all times and ages, those who have died in you now see you as you are. We thank you for, the live, for their lives among us. Ensure us of the peace you have promised, that we may join them in everlasting life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. This is the time in worship where we normally take up offering. Let's pray together our offering prayer. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. 
abide with us and send us in your service to a suffering world. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now prepare to receive Holy Communion. I want to show you these cups real quick because they're difficult to get into. They're double sealed. So the, the wafer is sealed under the first layer. You can see it's got kind of a, a red, I don't know if you can see, it's got kind of a red print there. And so you peel off the first layer and that releases the wafer. And then you've got the little tab thing here at the bottom. And you peel that back and it releases the grape juice. So it's a little bit tricky, but once you get the hang of it, it should be okay. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. The risen Christ invites us to his table Come, eat, and be satisfied. Amen.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord. The God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God. God's peace, everyone. Have a blessed week.